Your next speaker is Pim Elshoff. Pim is a developer for Hire from the Netherlands. Um, he and his team um, have used DDD to onboard the custom processes of um, several Dutch political parties. Um, and an interesting fact about him is that he's been weightlifting for almost a year now and can squat 160 kilograms and can deadlift 170. So please give a very warm round of applause to Pim. And if I had known that was not for technical difficulties only, I would have chosen something else. <laughs> Thank you all very much for, uh, for coming out. Uh, my name is Pim and this will be Technically DDD, where we will be talking about DDD technically and about Technically DDD. Um, my name is Pim, I'm a developer from the Netherlands. I work at a company called Procurios. We do all kinds of things around CRMs, including political parties these days. Pretty awesome. Uh, if you want to know more about us, you can check out developer.procurios.com. And uh, if you want to follow me on Twitter, it's at Pelsoft with two Fs. And uh, today we'll be talking about DDD. Now, I'm assuming most of you are familiar with, that's too far, I guess, with this slide. Uh, this is a short overview of DDD with all this stuff here. Uh, this is all the DDD stuff. Uh, I'm assuming most of you are already familiar with. Here is some stuff that's not DDD, don't be fooled, but all the other stuff that's DDD. Uh, I'm expecting most of you do not know this entirely. Uh, the keen eye among you will have seen that this is in fact the same as this one, uh, though slightly different because not with the other stuff. And this is also all important, that's also DDD. Any questions? <laughs> It's a lot. But today, I'm going to hopefully offer you something that you can start with. So we'll start by getting some context. What is this old DDD stuff everyone's talking about? Do you know it stands for Domain Driven Design? You've got that one already. But we will talk a bit more about context. What is it? Why are we talking about it? And what can it do for you? Um, we'll use only a very small part of DDD. That's what we're going to start with today. And that part is called the technical building blocks. And we'll be using those in our case study. But before we'll dive into our case study, we'll also look at a short quiz just to shake things up a little bit and fool you. <laughs> oh, I shouldn't have said that. So to get some context up front, are there any people in the room who do not do object-oriented programming? Yes, score. <laughs> Because this will be about object-oriented programming. Now, I don't know if your journey is anything like mine. I went to school and learned about functional programming because they weren't so happy and interested in object-oriented programming. Out of all the years I went to college, only one semester was spent on object-oriented programming with only one out of six courses. And that was it. That was my education on object-oriented programming. And all I got was well, you can have like class dog extends mammal and it can bark <laughs> and you also have like interfaces. That was my education. <laughs> that was my education on object oriented programming. So when I got out of school and I went into business, I quickly thought to myself, you know, I kind of know everything there is to know about object oriented programming. And maybe you've had the same thought too. I'm a little bit ashamed about it these days. <laughs> But I had this nagging sensation. How do I know if this design that I've constructed is any good? How do you know if it's any good? You have a feeling about it, it feels good, oh, it's readable or something like that, but how do you know? How do you know that it's any good? Has anyone heard about solid? Or maybe some of those tools like it? If you, if you haven't, it's fine. It's, it's the tool that helps us to say about an object-oriented design, it's not good here, and it's not good there. But it still doesn't help us to understand what is a good design. And so I was very happy to be introduced to DDD. I'm not saying DDD solves all the problems and all the issues, yada, 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 caveats up front, I'm sure. But it does help us to come to a better design. And that's what we're going to do today. 
I want to give you just enough so that you can start using some of these ideas. We're not going to do all the entire the, the schemas that I showed you, just a small bit. Just enough so that you can start saying to your friends and coworkers and family, look Ma, I'm doing DDD. And she will tell you, well, that's not DDD. And you say, well, technically. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm going to le hopefully leave you with a methodology today. A step plan that you can start using in your day job without having to convince everyone, we should do all these DDD stuff. Just something small that you can start doing. That I would actually say is object-oriented programming. But the author of the book says you can't say that, so I won't. So without further ado, if anyone has any questions, just go ahead and, and elsewise just you know, leave them for the end. That's fine too. But otherwise, we'll start diving into the technical building blocks. Everyone ready? Ah. Oh. What does it stand for? Uh, yeah, so the question was, what does DDD stand for? It stands for Domain Driven Design. Yeah, I quickly mentioned it. I should have mentioned it again. Domain Driven Design. So, and that means what drives our design, the choices that we make come from not our system, not our technical knowledge, but from the customer's environment, from their jargon, from their surroundings, from their context. Does that answer your question? Excellent. Good question. It was not stupid. I was stupid. Thank you very much. <laughs> Any other questions before we start looking at some code? Most excellent. So the technical building books. So let's, just, let's just dive right in and we'll see, uh, we'll see how we do. So the first thing that I'd like to share with you that you probably have heard of already at some point, is the value object. Who's never heard of value objects? Yes, we have something new. Yes, cool. So what is a value object? Does anyone want to take a gander? Anyone want to take a guess? Ooh, exciting. Yes, there in the back, just shout it. Yeah, kind of. A little bit. It's not all of it, yeah? That's certainly part of it too, yes, but we're still not entirely there. Immutable, Immutable very good, but that's kind of what the other Vlad was saying too. So you two are on the same, uh, on the same track. I probably should have repeated what he said so that you would know too. Ah, ah you're cheating. So a value object is an object that represents a value in the domain, but that also constrains the possible values that we can have in memory in our system. Value objects are part of our strategy to make the incorrect inexpressible. Value objects are part of our strategy to make the incorrect inexpressible. They are immutable. You can't update them once you've created them because they represent a value. Like if you have like a young child, he can get older, move from two years old to three years old, but the value of two doesn't change to three. Anyone ever moved to a new house, new address? Did the street of your address change and the number of your address change and the postcode of your address change? And the, or did you move to a new address? Even in the way we talk about this, we can kind of say in this domain of moving, address is a single value, even though it holds values itself. Let's look at an example. So what have we got here? We've got a value object, and this value object is called name, and it represents a person's name, just a part of it apparently enough for this code base. And this name consists of a last name, first name, and insertion. But there's a rule in here. Can everybody see the rule? A name must have a last name. What happens if we don't have a last name? We throw an exception. That might seem a bit harsh to you, but this is part of our strategy to make the incorrect inexpressible. It is not possible. 
in this system to have a name in memory that is incorrect. It's impossible. That means that every other part of our system is guaranteed to rely on a correct name. No other part of the system has to ever worry about checking anything about name because it's done here and it's done finally. Does that make sense? You can also see that we can't update this. This is what it is. If you want to change someone's name, you have to change someone's name entirely. Make sense? Yeah. Let's move to another one. Here we see email address. This one's maybe not as spectacular. It only holds one value. It wraps around the string, one might say. And again, there is a value in here. And a, a rule, I mean, sorry. And the rule says email address must be an actual email address. Makes sense. So every other part of the system knows that if it gets an email address object, that it's actually a valid email address. This is how we make sure that the rules in our system, the simpler rules, are checked. Everybody with me? So let's recap value objects. Value objects express a value, yeah, sure. But they also define the range of allowed values. They're immutable, we can't change them once they've created them. And they're easy to test. Why are they easy to test? I'll wait. That's not true. It doesn't have to be, but we'll see. <laughs> There's no state change. So that means a value object requires very little setup. And usually all we do is check that we can't construct them in certain situations. And maybe if we get more interesting value objects, but we'll see about those later, maybe the testing will be a little bit harder. But one of the things that makes the testing very easy is indeed there's no external dependencies. It's just about the internal consistency of the value object because that's what value objects do. They make the incorrect inexpressible. Questions about value objects? Yes, one. Uh, Only one. How do you know? Maybe someone else has a question. <laughs> Um, so I have little, ex little experience with value objects, but what happens if you, for example, with the first example you had with the names, someone would, let's say email, maybe a bit, they change your email, what happens to the old value object? Does it stay inside your database or? Well, value objects are a memory thing. So what's, say, what's in your database is what's in your database, but this is about code, about running code. Does, I mean, that's not entirely an answer, I'm just saying the question makes no sense. It's <laughs> probably because I don't have much experience using value objects, so I'm not sure where it fits Yeah, so this is all about running code. This entire presentation will be about running code. I'm explicitly leaving the boundaries of the system away because it's too much to put into one presentation, but I would say that in this instance, if you would update someone's email address, the updating itself during the runtime of the PHP stuff, that will all be this. What happens on the database level, that will be your implementation of a repository or doctrine or whatever. We'll kind of look at this maybe a little bit later. Would it be right to say that? Uh... He's, a, he's got a big voice, that's not needed. <laughs> So what you're saying in the context of the code, in updating the email address would be replacing one value object with another. Yeah. And we'll actually look at this right now. Because one step up from value objects on the conceptual ladder in the DDD technical building blocks, domain driven design, the technical building blocks are entities. Now you might be familiar with the term entity because you all use doctrine, right? So an entity is something you can store in a database and get from a database and database, database, database. But in terms of what your customer is concerned with, 
Your customer will talk about things, objects, people from their problem space. And those things will have interesting interaction in the domain. They will have a life path. Stuff will happen to them or they will do stuff. And that's the magical cloud we call entities. An entity is an interesting object in the domain that has interesting interaction. So one example for one thing, for example, could be an attendee, maybe at a conference somewhere. And an attendee can have a name and an email address and an ID, because entities have identity. But what this attendee cannot have is not a name and not an email address. Do you see that? There is no way in this system to get an attendee in memory without an email address or name. So the validity of this attendee is guarded by the validity of the value objects and the fact that this entity cannot exist without its value objects. The rules are checked in value objects and the entity's consistency is guaranteed by that. So, to answer your question with a specific example, if we were to update someone's email address, this is where the magic would happen, this is where one value object would be replaced by another, and probably your attendee would be persisted in a database in some manner. Does it make sense, this entity example? Yes. No, that's entirely true, because entities are not immutable. I forgot, I thought it was my object, sorry. No, it's fine. No, take, your, take your time. This is difficult stuff. And it's, no, no, it is, it is. Why are you laughing? This is difficult stuff. Especially if you've not used, if you've not used this kind of things before, and if you've used the doctrine variants and, and all the other variants. Having a good sense of what fits where is very important to make things easier. And we'll look at that later during the case study. Entity clear? Entity clear? So to recap, an entity is something that has an identity and interesting behavior, interesting interaction with the domain. They are more than just the set of their attributes, which means they cannot be identified by the set of their attributes, which is why they have a usually a system-generated ID. They evolve over time. They have a life cycle, a path. Why are they harder to test than value objects? Yeah, because they have dependencies on value objects, possibly. And also they can change. So that means that if you want to test an entity in a certain state, moving to another certain state, that that's more difficult. Questions about entities? Ideas about what would come next? So one conceptual step up from entities is services. In DDD terms, in domain-driven design terms, a service is something your customer will talk about as if it's a thing. But it's not. For example, they'll talk about their invoicing. Or they'll talk about their shipping or their order processing or whatever. Those are all processes that have no identity, no state. But they talk about it as if it's a thing. But it's something that happens. It's something that covers certain aspects of the business has certain rules revolving around it. So an example for example could be a registration. Say we want to only allow attendees that have a unique email address. That's a piece of knowledge. Is it a unique email address? That's a piece of knowledge that's too much for a single entity to know. Can you imagine if Amazon would store all email addresses in the system with every customer just to make sure that every customer knows about all the email that would that would be impossible to load and save again. 
So this is not a rule that can be covered by a value object. This is not a, a rule that can be covered by an entity. This rule has to be covered by something that's larger than an entity, that has more responsibility, more knowledge than an entity. And that's, in this instance, a service. And this service makes sure email address must be unique. Now you might have a different idea on how to implement this, but this is my specific implementation and my example of a service. Questions about this? Is it clear? So services, no identity, are not a thing. People talk about them as if they are. They usually have some business rule that they need to take care of. And it's especially convenient if it's a business rule that has more than one entity required in terms of information. Why are services harder to test even than entities? Yeah, possibly. Maybe even more than one entity to test. If a entity is hard to test, then two entity would be even more harder to test her. <laughs> so services, harder to test. We prefer, so we can conclude at this point, we prefer our business rules to be in value objects over entities, over services, because our value objects are so much easier to test. So services, fine. Repositories, I had it on the slide. I have to mention it. I don't want to mention it. Um, you also, if you are a Doctrine user or something, are familiar with the term repository. It's the object that you ask for entities for, I guess. I don't use Doctrine that much myself. Um, in terms of DDD, a repository is responsible for holding almost or all objects of a certain type. It's the thing you ask for if you want entities. That's really all I want to say about it, because we're not going to be using it for the rest. But I had it on a slide, so I have to mention it. Repositories are a collection of almost all objects of a certain entity type. Everybody still awake? That was the theory. That was all the theory that we'll be covering today. That was all about DDD that I want to cover. And I think it's more than enough for the first time. Don't you agree? So let's do a little quiz just to shake things up, make sure everyone's still awake. Tell me if this final class address is a value object, entity, or service. Value object, sir. Get out. <laughs> so address, like a speech or something you, you prepare and then you give it and you collect feedback. So it has an interesting interaction, obviously evolves over time. That's an entity. Bicycle service, value object, entity, service. <laughs> it's in the name, right? Oh, you learn quickly. No one dares anymore. <laughs> so a bicycle service is obviously like you, you, you're going to get your bike fixed. So that's something you plan and then it happens. And it's obviously an entity. A street address. Street address. Easy. In Dutch, um, we have this organization called the Cadaster. There's probably something like it in England as well that's responsible for managing all the addresses in the Netherlands. Whenever a new street is created, they determine the postcodes. Whenever the street is removed again 60 years later, they remove the addresses again. So obviously, this is an entity in their context. <sighs> Investment, value object, entity service. By now, you obviously all get the game. Depending on the context, you can't really say on what it is. What would be a value object in one domain would be an entity in another. Now, this one's funny because this is one that we encountered in real life that was both a value object and an entity and possibly a service for the same customer. They're a wonderful customer. We've had a lot of interaction with them. Uh, they do social banking. They invest in 
uh, startups in third world countries. And uh, so you can do an investment in them, which means you buy shares. And when you do that investment, that's kind of like a thing. Then you can't update it anymore because it's something that happens. It's a value object. But of course, all the investments you do go into your account, and your account has a balance, and that's what's called an investment. And that does change over time. Of course, you can invest in more than one of their subsidiaries, so that's all entirely your investment. And of course, they talk about the investment process. So naming, naming is hard and important and all that, but it really does depend a whole lot on the context of your customer, not your own interpretation, but your customer's interpretation on what it means. And we want to write code that basically our customers could read. You saw the examples earlier. You could give that to a customer and say, here, go read this. Are all the rules in there? Oh, name must have, oh, email address must have, yeah, all the rules are in there. So naming, it's hard. And that's enough for a quiz, I don't think uh, you'd like any much more than that. So if you're all kind of still awake, I would like to move on to some actual coding. Yeah? Everybody ready for that? So what we're going to do, we're going to do a case study based on a fictional company with some fictional code. Were people in my workshop yesterday, they might recognize some parts of it, because we'll be talking about this I can't swear, but it's... <laughs> we'll be talking about a meeting object. This is an entity, and it's stripped from our own code base. Slightly adapted, some stuff cut out, but this is a piece of entity that is actually kind of live today. What we have here is a meeting that is taking place at a certain point in time. It has a program, and it has some information to show whereabouts it is, uh, whenabouts, I mean. And uh, there's nothing checked here. No rules whatsoever. And of course, if that happens, people will start entering data and everything will go wrong. So what we're going to do is we're going to use fictional tickets as a driver for new requirements, and we're going to use those requirements as a driver for improving our code slightly. Just slightly. Just something that you could start doing well, probably not today, but Monday. So how will we do? Oh, first, let's, let's take a look at how to make one of these. Um, just some example data, especially the program. Absolutely wonderful. This is an example that works really well in PHP, not so much in other programming language, because PHP arrays are awesome and horrible at the same time. Um, is this clear to everyone, this example we'll be working with? Yeah. Who has never done anything like this? Oh, wow. Who's still doing this? It's okay. I hope I can show you a, a, a way to not do this anymore. So what are we going to do? We're going to do the following. I'm going to use one of these rules, like meetings cannot end before they start. And this rule is going to be the driver for what we are going to tackle. And we're going to do it nice. But... We also would like to be able to ship it at any time because creating value is already hard enough in a bad code base. So we're not going to make any major messes. We're just going to first implement whatever rule we get. Just implement it even if it looks horrible. Once we've implemented this rule, we'll extract a value object from it and then we'll make that value object pretty. That's the approach that I want to leave you with today. Implement whatever rule you get in the entity, extract a value object, and refactor that value object to make it look good. Everybody ready for that? All right, so let's first uh, take this rule. Meetings cannot end before they start, and implement it in the entity in the manner that you've already seen. And that could look something like this. We have our meeting, we add the rule to the constructor of our meeting right at the very end. And we call it, meetings cannot end before start. Very sensible, people can read that. The implementation might be a little bit harder for people to read. 
it's not horrible, but you know. And we're going to take this rule and all the information that this rule needs in order to be satisfied. And we're going to create a value object out of that. So what we're going to do, this rule, this private function here, and start date and end date and start time and end time, they're going to go away from the meeting, which means the meeting ends up looking like this. Instead of those four attributes to denominate when the meeting happens, we just have a single meeting duration. You might favor another name, that's fine. This is my code, I favored this one. I just have a single duration object in here that will be a value object and that represents this duration of the meeting and that enables us to have this rule in our code. What would that look like? Well, that looks something like this. It's not that complicated, I don't think. Everybody with me still? It's okay if you're not. We're only going to go faster, so. <laughs> how, how much time do I have left? Oh, that's fine. Wonderful. So, um, this meeting duration, this is our second step. We have our value object now. Now it's time to make this a little bit better. What can we do to make this better? Just shout out something. Daytime immutable. Yes, of course, daytime immutable. Excellent suggestion. So we have our start date, end date, start time, and end time. Those are strings. We hate strings. We don't want strings. So what we're going to do is we're going to merge all those and make sure that this meeting duration only gets daytime immutables. Why daytime immutable instead of daytime? <laughs> Ten points to Gryffindor. <laughs> so that could look something like this. Makes our meeting duration look a little simpler. Makes our rule a lot simpler make use of the power of value objects, and we have implemented our rule and cleaned up a little bit. Isn't that wonderful? Just a slight refactor to meeting, but what we didn't do is sit down and think, oh, what would be a better way for meeting to look like so that the rule would be easier? No, we said, we implement the rule first, and then we make it better. And that means that we know, we know what the value object is going to be, because we already have the rule with all the properties that it needs to be satisfied. Does that make sense? Does it make sense to have this first rule and then extract approach? It makes sure that you can ship at any time because you always have created just a little bit more value than before without making a mess. So what would our meeting end up looking like to be created? That's I think the next slide, yes. So our meeting, instead of having the strings just passed in there, now we create daytime immutables that we pass to our meeting duration. Yeah. It's a little bit more complicated to create a meeting now, but it does more. It checks the rules. So I think that was our first assignment. Yeah. Oh, thank you. <laughs> so let's look at another one. Oh, unless anyone have any questions? Yeah. Okay, good. So let's look at another one. A bit more complicated. Program slots cannot occur in the same room at the same time. Now you can imagine what a mess it must have been for this rule to become at the top of our backlog. People were fighting over who was going to present in this room. So it's time to make our code a little bit better. So what's the first thing we're going to do? <laughs> 10 points to you. Which, which house is yours? So this is the program as it is while we set out to tackle this problem. It's pretty rough. Pretty rough. Arrays. Blech. But rules are rules and we implement the rule in the entity first. So that could look something like this. Now you can assume I've written tests for this and all testing is not part of this talk, but it would be pretty hard to write tests for this. It would not be fun. But you can just kind of assume that this kind of works. Yeah? Anybody have anything against this slide? Except that it's not pretty. Fine, so let's get rid of this as quick as we can and extract a value object. Now, this rule doesn't use any other data than the program property. So we're just going to take that program property and this rule and create a nice program object. And that 
would leave our meeting looking like this. Instead of an array program, we now have a program program. And our entity is cleaned up again. No rules, just value objects and ugliness. So our program would end up looking like this. We have a value object that receives a single property that's not very pretty. And we have a rule to satisfy that program slots cannot occur in the same room at the same time. And we're done. And we can ship it. But we have more time. So what we're going to do is we're going to make this pretty. Now how are we going to make this pretty? What would be the first thing we want to get rid of? The arrays. So what kind of thing do the arrays represent? Yeah, so we call them program slots and it's already there in the name and it's already there in the rule. So we're going to call them program slots and we're going to extract these program slots from the program. And that would leave our program looking like this. Now I've done something interesting here. Instead of trying to satisfy this rule ourselves, we are going to task these program slots with solving part of this rule. Why do we do that? Well, because the program slots have the information. So instead of adding getters to the program slots, getting all the information ourselves and figuring it out, we just say, uh, well, you figure it out. So this slot overlaps with that slot. If that happens for any two slots, then invalid program because program slots overlap. Now, what would that overlaps with look like? Because it's nice that we shoved it under the carpet. Well, that could look something like this. Oh, and this is very nice. Because if we read the previous slide, we say, well, what does it mean for program slots to cannot occur in the same room at the same time? Well, that means that for any two slots, if they overlap with each other, then that's bad. So this problem, this big problem, we gave that a certain interpretation. This big problem, what does it mean? Well, it means that this code. And again, this slot overlaps with that slot. What does that mean? Well, for two slots to overlap, it means the rooms overlap and the durations overlap. We are splitting our big difficult problems into smaller problems. And we're giving the smaller problems their own code to be dealt with. But again, I shoved something under the carpet. What does it mean for two durations to overlap? Well, that means, that means this. And that's not pretty. You see, I've reused the meeting duration. I kind of stepped over that in the previous slide. We've reused the meeting duration as part of our slot. And uh, we can add this function overlaps with to make sure that these meeting durations can tell us whether they overlap. But again, this isn't very pretty. I really do enjoy this, uh, this pattern of, of this versus that. It's sometimes a little bit hard on the autocomplete, but it is very nice to read. But this is rough code, because this, I think even the, the fourth one is not even needed. I'm not sure. It's, it's unreadable. But this code means something. What does it mean that this star is larger or equal than that star and this star is... Maybe we can find a word to describe what happens here. Ooh, that's better. So if one duration contains the start or the end of the other, or the other contains the start of the end of the one, Uh, wait a uh, it reads a little bit better, it's a little bit more descriptive. We're actually using words instead of just robo code, but it's still rough. What are we dealing with here? Time is always rough, isn't it? But what we're really doing. So if we have two durations, well all that can happen that we're, that we're interesting in and overlapping is like so. We have one duration that is like this with the other duration, or it's like this. Can we see this kind of okay? <laughs> so like this duration is either like this, or this, or this, or this. That's what we're interested in, right? So everything we're interested in is not this or this. Oh. Huh. 
oh, that's interesting. So what would that look like? Well, that could look something like this. So we thought out of side of the box a little bit. Well, that's really nice. It's still, with the, but, huh. so what does this mean again? Well, this means that if this isn't before that, and that isn't before this, then we overlap. That's really nice. It's readable. Do you agree? Is this nice? Yeah. Except there's two bugs. Does anyone want to take a guess on the two bugs? One's tricky, and the other one's darn right rancid. Sorry? Why is that a problem? Yeah, so he's pointing out that this is a problem. Why is that a problem? Well, mathematically, it's true that if one is large, math, math, okay. <laughs> Meetings, not okay. Because it's perfectly fine to have a schedule where one slot ends and the other begins at the same time. That's how we, that's how we put that. It would be really weird to say, well, the one ends at like 10.59 and the other starts at 11. That would be awkward. We don't do that. So in the domain of meetings, this is not what before is, even though mathematically that's true. So I, as a developer, made the mistake that my math is always correct. Because that's not what's correct for our customers in their domain. And their domain drives our design. So this is incorrect. There's another bug. You found the slightly easier bug. Sorry? Yeah, that's a PHP thing. It's keen eye, but a PHP actually allows that as long as both objects are of the exact same type. Accessors are determined statically. So that allows us to not have getters. Um, Can you see that? Yeah. Oh, sorry. Yeah, so he says uh, before it's called privately. Oh, before it's private, but you can call it here or not this. That should break to, you think, but it doesn't. I think Java allows this too, I'm not entirely sure, but PHP allows this. PHP determines access on a static basis and not on a dynamic basis in this instance. So it's not per object, it's per class. So that means we don't need getters. Yes. But the other bug, the other bug is a slightly more nefarious. So we started out with these program arrays and these progr uh, program slot arrays, and they were horrible. But there was an implicit rule in there that we may have missed. I'm not sure if I got it on the next slide. No, I didn't. So I'll just go back for a little bit. So these have a date and a start time end time. They don't allow in the old code to have program slots go overnight. This is maybe not, not what they intended. But if we are going to refactor, if we are going to change how it works, or, uh, change the manner in which it works without changing how it behaves, we need to, to keep this behavior intact. So we can't just refactor and just make things break. What we have to do is do it nice. So we have to give slots their own duration object that's more constrained. And we can immediately fix the bug too. So that will look something like this. The slot duration would have another rule that slots must start and end on the same day and would have our before greater than or equals fixed. So we got a long way to the previous slide just on our programmer expertise. But in order to do it perfectly correctly, we need to talk to our customer and figure out what their domain is like. We cannot supplant our understanding of what we think a domain is like to the actual customer's understanding. Sense? Questions? Yes. There's quite a lot of examples here of throwing exceptions in constructors. 
Is that typically how you end up, or can you refactor that away at all? Make the incorrect inexpressible. Whatever is not correct should not be allowed to enter memory. That's how most of your bugs probably happen. That's a bold statement, but I, I stand by it. <laughs> what do you think? Well, um... <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I can't remember the exact source, but I think there's been a number of people over the years have said that it's something to avoid. I mean, I know that if you're trying to unit test, it can be challenging, well, impossible, um, if you're trying to mock methods to then trap that. Um, you can't mock them, yeah. create it, and then track the behavior. So for that reason, I, okay, yeah, good. So you couldn't do that way either. Yeah, okay. So you, Nothing about this is mockable, yeah. and I never mock. <laughs> Classes. So to make a little bit more of an informative answer, uh, the, in making the incorrect inexpressible means you cannot have anything be allowed into memory that's incorrect. Even if you're like, well, I'll fix it later, I'll check it later, no. no. Code is like really, really complicated, so we make sure that we cannot make the mistake. Now, is that ideal in terms of what other people have said about exceptions? Well, probably not. Um, Everyone has their own preference on how to deal with that kind of thing. Um, exceptions thrown in domain code should probably never be triggered. Because anything that goes in here is probably going to come from a form or somewhere, and that has a definition with, uh, um, how do you say that in English? Uh, with, with their constraints already on the form elements and stuff like that. So I hope that whenever you call this code, most of it will already be checked. These exceptions prevent domain corruption. Yeah? All right. Other questions? Most excellent. So let's see what our code ends up looking like to be called. Meeting started looking like this. This is what we set off with, and it ends up looking like this. A little bit more, but remember, all the rules that are checked now were not checked before, so this is a lot more powerful, even if it seems like a lot more stuff to construct. Um, it does really tie in here, but, but it's just where, where I noticed. Um, you, you mentioned in one of the rules, room, and, and right now you, you don't really have a room value object or entity. The room is still a string. And, and um, do you think it's a problem that, that basically you already have things in your um, rules that, that don't really exist as a concept in your DDD structure? Do you think it's a problem? Um, well, the simplified example, uh, not as much, but... You think this is simplified? <laughs> <laughs> well, co com compared to, to like the, the whole complex thing when it's... Um, yeah, when, when there's more interactions and, and, and more service basically producing the room or, or to, uh, using the room. So, so right now the room is not really that used, that's what I mean. Yeah. So your, your question is kind of on two levels. You have an opinion about this domain because, well, it doesn't make sense for room to just be a text. That's an opinion about the domain. Um, your customer is the one who determines a lot of things about that. So you could agree with your customer that, well, you know, rooms are not really a big thing. It's fine to just have a label and, 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 and go with it. That could be something you agreed upon with your customer. And then room would be fine as a string. Probably we would still make a value object out of it at some point, but only when we get rules. The methodology I want to leave you with today is to have new requirements drive what you do, and that's all you do. You don't do anything that doesn't add value, but you still are allowed to do a little bit of DDD. So this is, a, this is the way I think that you get started with DDD. Does that answer your question? You said you, you guessed? You're not entirely sure? Can I, can I just clarify that? Sorry. You're going to clarify my answer? <laughs> Sorry, so are you saying you don't make value objects for value objects' sake, that you only create a value object where you have a rule that needs enforcing on yeah. that value? I have done absolutely nothing that didn't lead to either a implementation of a rule 
or making something we just implemented a little bit better. It's all about getting started with very small steps. Small things you can do to make it better. Oh, there. Run. <laughs> Throw the mic. You talk about this as a methodology for improving what's already there. If you were creating this as a new system, would you, uh, would you have the uh, room as a string, or would you, or would you start with a, a value object, even if you didn't have any rules that you were associating with that? I hate to do this. It depends. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's, it's, it's almost impossible to say, because it all depends on what you agree upon with your customer, on what room actually means. What does the room mean? Does it mean anything more than just a label we slap on something, and does the system care about it? Are there any rules that are constrained by it? Or is it something that actually matters? And Maybe a room is an entity. Who knows? I don't know. No, you think that's a rule. That's your perception of the domain. Be careful with this. Your customer determines the truth in this domain. You just implement it. Don't supplant their understanding of the domain with your own. Question them, but don't tell them. That's not our job. Our job is to make good software, not to tell them their domain is wrong. Oh, I love that though. <laughs> it's wonderful if you get the chance, but yeah. So how do you tackle this with your clients at this point? Do they like come in every week, every day? Do you question stuff? Do you tell them like, hey, we need the rules up front? How do you deal with the client side on that one to know all about their domain? Ooh. We do um, several sessions with them, uh, amongst which event storming. Uh, and they sit with us in our office as we work. And they regularly check in on what we do. I, I, I kind of, we kind of laughed about it. I, I actually show them my code and have them read it at times. Yeah. Other questions? Yes. Oh. Oh, that's nice, isn't it? Oh, that's so nice. Um, you see, you don't make value objects unless there's like some kind of business rule you need to validate, right? What about just correctness validation, like, okay, it's a label, so it might not need a value object, but what if the label is like a smiley face or something like that? Like, like how, do you know what I mean? Like, surely... If there's rules, you implement the rule in the entity, you extract a value object, you refactor the value object. What I mean is like, you're saying like, only create a value object when you actually have a requirement for it. And I'm, I'm saying, well, uh, uh, otherwise you just have strings, right? Like, the, like... Intro. I'm not saying anything about otherwise. I'm just saying, if there is a rule, implement it in an entity, extract a value object, refactor the value object. So if something doesn't have a rule, but you want to make sure it's correct, doesn't that imply That's that you, a need rule. A, you need a value object for everything? Otherwise, if you, how do you know it's right or not? Yeah, if something has to be correct, that's a rule. Well, I get, in that context, everything has to be correct, no? I don't know. Like, <laughs> well, you know, do you understand what, what, I'm, what I'm getting at? Like, no, I, 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 I think I do, but I'm not sure, because uh, I really don't think the answer is more complicated than, than what I'm saying. We have a meeting object here at the end um, that's still instantiated, for example, with this as a subtitle. Now, if it's okay if subtitle is an empty string, or if it's okay if it's a smiley face, or if it's okay if it's Korean swear words, that's all fine with me. I'm not going to make anything to deal with that. But if subtitle has to be at least one character, that's a value object right there. Okay. But you implement it as an entity. From, yeah? Thank you. Uh. Ah! <laughs> the other one. <coughs> the last one. That one. 
uh, on the the model there is a flag there on the uh, model false doesn't that be a bit non-descriptive of what we going start on? with legacy code this is all legacy code so yes that is non-descriptive that's what legacy code does No, I would not remodel it unless there is a rule. No, this is this is this is exactly this approach. Just do what you're told, but do it well. <laughs> so one of the major problems people have with getting started with DDD, I actually heard someone say it. They were not coming to this session because they were not gonna get DDD in anyway. This is what my session's about. Start with something you can do without people coming at your desk and saying, what are you doing? You're all the DDD stuff. No, just something small. Just something small. Don't change everything. We have time for one more question. Hi. Um, do you have any recommendations for introductory resources other than this for DDD? I started with Eric Evans' book a while back and it's pretty heavy going. Um, yeah. Is there anything better out there that I should be looking at? Oh, well, there is actually, that's, that's a really good question. Um, Eric Evans is the author of what's called the Blue Book, the original book uh, tackling to complexity in the heart of software. And uh, the Blue Book is colloquially named like, like one of the hardest, difficult to understand, dense. Um, and it, it's written exactly like Eric Evans speaks. He's a wonderful speaker, but he's so slow and contemplative. And, and he, like, his mind just goes in every direction at the same time. And that's what the book does, too. So another man, Von Vernon, wrote the Red Book, which is called Implementing DDD, which talks about, oh, this is all the stuff. And, and you can do, and, and, uh, and after he published it, he thought, wow, this is still really hard. So he wrote another book, which I forgot the name of. It's called The Green Book. Um, and I think it should probably be called Implementing, Implementing DDD. <laughs> and that talks about how to apply the ideas out of that book. But I think the red book is the one you want to go with. Big round of applause, please, for Pim.